Welcome to the Home Lab Show, episode 64. We're going to talk about tail scale and head scale and hopefully make heads or tails of it. <laughs> and any other pun I yep. can insert. <laughs> well, you know what? Any episode number that's a multiple of eight has to be a good one, right? Yes. We'll absolutely say that as well. So we are excited to talk about this subject. And before we get deep into the show here, let's thank a sponsor who's very relevant this time. And it's Linode. And why is a why is Linode relevant? Well, when we get to the part about head scale, one of the important things is going to be that you have to have a public IP to run the head scale server on. If you don't have a public IP, it's not going to work very well for you if you plan to use this in a way that you share out the network with everyone. So Linode's been a sponsor of the show since the beginning. They've been a great sponsor. They have just a really solid tool set that you can use for building a lot of these projects, building it through automation, building it through their market, or just spinning up raw Linux servers, which is probably what you'd want to do to set up a head scale server. It doesn't take much. Even one of their really basic plans will handle it because the traffic does not pass through as we'll be discussing uh, in this video. It also is where you'll be setting up derp servers. So yes, we will talk about what a derp server is as well, because it's part of in there. So run your derp servers on Linode. And uh, we have an offer code, the Home Lab Show, to get you started with them. So thank you, Linode, for sponsoring. And uh, yeah, it's a great place to run a derp server. I, I, I like that they took the time to come up with derp server when they were designing some of the tail scale stuff. So <laughs> it's funny. I've been using that word a lot myself because um, for people that don't know, when you use um, when you're editing video, if you use um, what we use, you know, DaVinci Resolve, like the file extension is .drp. So I'll say say to myself, I'm going to back up the derp file for the video that I'm editing because it's drp. What else would you call it? Yeah, um, sometimes. Yep. And theirs is actually derp as in designated encrypted relay for packets. <laughs> That's better, actually. I don't know what the file extension was probably DaVinci Resolve something anyway. Yeah, but it doesn't uh, derp. We're going to go derp. Well, I'm going <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what is tail scale and what problem does it solve? Now, before we get to the head scale part, I put that in here because we're going to talk about first tail scale and everything that it can do, because that's a a lot of complexity to kind of navigate and I'll have, well, I shouldn't say will have, I already have links that are in the show notes uh, so you can dive deep into this because they've done a great job of not just documenting things, uh, documenting how stun works, how nat traversal works, all the different trickery you can do for nat traversal. It's a good lesson in network engineering. And the mm -hmm. product uses an entire bag of network engineering tricks that are all documented and things you can, well, do with the that's within the limits of the RFC, along with um, more fun that they're having with it. So they've done some really clever things to make all of this magic work. So that's why I think it's a really interesting uh, open source project. It's a really interesting network engineering project. And by the way, it solves a problem that we've discussed many times on here. And that specific problem is, how do you handle if you're a firewall and recently pfSense added and I did a video on this the integration for tailscale how do you handle when your firewall does not have a public IP but you would like to VPN back to it and tailscale is just a dead simple easy solution to do this even if you have several devices or several firewalls and you'd like to mesh them all together into a big network um, I think this was hands down the easiest site to site VPN I ever set up with uh, PF sets. Like it's, it takes you minutes, um, literally just minutes to get it all configured. There's no, it just, I will say it makes it simple. That's why I figured talking about tail scale um, is just a lot of fun. And I already see comments in there. UDP hole punch for the win. Yes. That's essentially yep. how it works. <laughs> And we did a full episode on that, didn't we? I thought we did. We talked about overlay networks in general. Um, okay. I wanted to narrow this one down to very specifically tail scale. Now, the other overlay networks out there um, are good. Zero Tier and Nebula. Those are pretty cool. Nebula is a different approach compared to the other ones. I kind of single them out uh, because Nebula is only self-hosted. There is no central Nebula server, but Nebula also doesn't have as many things in its bag of tricks because it has a different use case. It's kind of a DevOps tool. It's actually used by Slack and it's developed by one of my friends. Uh, he's CEO of the company and we chat 
uh, from time to time about it. That's actually one of the reasons the video I thought was really cool because it's a, it's the open source infrastructure that manages the back end of Slack. It's how they manage, and many other companies too. Um, every server to get deployed is part of a Nebula node, and it's like a overlay network. So you have a locked down management control plane across all of your public IP space. So they actually don't trans tra traverse any commands. Um, over standard, like even SSH or a VPN tunnel, they actually have access to everything over there. Now you can do all this with Tailscale as well. Um, the only reason Slack and why Nebula was developed is because they were aware of other protocols out there, but they also said, we are Slack, we host our infrastructure, we don't do third parties. And at the time, I don't think Headscale was an option. Headscale came later uh, to the yeah. game part we'll talk about, which is allowing you to self-host it. Because even though Tailscale is open source, the control mechanism in the site is a product. It is a service um, and they have a free tier. So you can absolutely sign up for it. So this is all, you know, there's, there's a lot you can dive into. And I think I forgot what episode number it is on overlay networks, but yeah, we, we did cover some of that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so, great. So we can dive into, um, you know, a technology even deeper, which is always a great thing to do. So I'm, I'm very interested because this might actually be something that, I'll implement myself after we're done recording this. So yeah, and the cool thing is uh, with Tailscale is they've done uh, such a nice job with documentation and putting things together. It is supported on a lot of devices, um, so you can load this up not just on PF Sense, but uh, Synology has support for it. So people who want access or would like to build a network of Synologies, where you could say, "I need all these Synologies," and one of the use cases that we have, like business use cases, is companies that want to set up a bunch of Synology surveillance stations and they go, but I don't really want to or may not have access to opening up a public cloud for these. This is where Tailscale can assign an address to each one of your Synologies. And, you know, let's say a client has 20 locations. Those 20 locations can be tied to Tailscale and then their phone can be tied to Tailscale and they're easily choosing between all 20 locations to view cameras. There's some mm -hmm. slick things you can really do with it like that. And uh, it's, you know, open source. You can run it on Linux, Mac, Windows, and BSD. So you've got lots of devices you can load it on to get access uh, to all these different networks. And of course, it also supports routing and exit noting, which the routing protocols means it can see adjacent devices. And this is what it's implemented with in the PF Sense system where you actually turn it on as a route and you say, hey, I want to show or share with the tail scale, uh, the other tail scale nodes that talk to it, but then also see everything in your routing path. So everything on a particular subnet that you want can also be shared with it. That way you're only loading tail scale on one device, but then if you have a bunch of devices, maybe you don't have access to share tail scale on, it can do that. So it's got a lot of really cool features on there uh, like that. But I want to start with who is Tailscale and what they're doing? Because it's an interesting company because they've got a pretty big team. There's a lot of people there that have worked on some very large projects previously. And I think this is really cool because I like what they're saying here. And I'm going to read a little bit of their company page. We're building the new internet, small, trusted human scale networks. We're returning to the original vision of the internet. We want to help everyone create their own secure networks built around their social connections. Whether you want to connect with your coworkers to share a prototype, the company database for security access information, or family members to share files and photos, Tailscale makes networking safe and understandable. And I think Jay said it best when I we were first talking about overlay networks. You're like, this is how I thought VPNs always should have worked. <laughs> I think that's how you said it. Well, it wasn't necessarily um vpns it was how before i knew how networking worked networking in general when i was first coming into this before i even learned my first thing about networking i'm like there's probably like some kind of application on both ends that are kind of like you know you know it, you know creating a connection and um that's how it works right but no um i mean they're at the protocol level it gets much deeper obviously but i really thought that that was the way it worked and then i remember when i first started in it how much money the company was spending that I worked for just having a wide area network through AT&T was ginormous, the cost um, in yeah. the early 2000s. And it's like nowadays, what I really enjoy seeing is when companies like disrupt everything, like you get this thing that's super expensive to implement, to purchase. And they're like, yeah, let's just like do it. Not that way, but like, we'll just give it away for free because there's a way to do it. And, and then you can, um, depending on the company, pay for more um features or whatever but still it's not like a couple grand a month per connection i mean it's just 
like so within reach more than it's ever been. And I think that things like this, making everything easier is exactly what the industry needs. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's part of their ethos because they're, you know, this is right from their page. We are working to remove the overhead and complexity from the long tail of software and operational problems that people face every day. By making connectivity easier and more secure, we empower small teams to build systems at scale without scaling overhead. And I think this is just really cool because even though they're a business and a product, they're really dedicated to open source. And this is something I found and I didn't really go deep into vetting it, but I've seen a good discussion on Reddit on this. Um, when I was doing my research on Headscale, they even take the time to contribute to the Headscale tool, which technically subverts their business in some way because, you know, you're still, Tailscale is open source, but, you know, they want you to buy, they have a free version or a free sign up to use their control plane, but obviously they have a business model and they have a fee they charge for it that pays for the development of it. Um, but they still take the time to one, contribute uh, actively to the Go community that they do a lot of. They keep the client free and open source so anyone can look at it, which of course they even don't have hard coded within the product uh, where the control plane server is. So they built it, allowing people to kind of mess with it and then take it a step further. Someone comes up with the head scale project. They're among the people contributing code back to it going, Oh yeah, yeah, that's cool. Well, you're cool. You're building this thing. Let me help. And I think that's awesome. They even like their yeah. derp server, um, is open source and they didn't have to open source it. If you looked at it from a business model, because that's part of the coordination server, they open source that too. And uh, this is what makes Tailscale to be a really interesting product because you can do a lot of this. So they have a clear commitment open source, which, you know, aligns with me. And I've always uh, said this. I'm not someone who dislikes open source because it's free and neither is Shay. We like it when there's a business model behind it because that means it's sustainable. It gets security audited. And it gets updates. We look for it as a solution because we think the code should be open. But I do like when you combine that with, yes, some type of business model around it, especially when it's a, you know, a fair, reasonable business model for how they want to do things. It just makes a better ecosystem. I think for me, the, that kind of thing could be a tiebreaker, whether or not I want to go with the service is how they treat the community. So if I'm on the fence about two equal technologies, that just could be the thing that makes me actually consider using them. And I love hearing that instead of like sending a cease and desist to a project, they're like, yeah, we'll just help you out. Um, yeah, they should send that memo to Nintendo because they really need to hear that. Yes, exactly. It's one of those things like it, it, how, how do you deal with someone maybe copying some of your product or just making something available? And I see, you know, Headscale is going to be probably a lot towards your home lab audience. That's why it's going to be in this as part of the topic or why I brought it up. Uh, in this particular discussion, but it's just kind of cool that they're not trying to stop them from doing it. And matter of fact, they're helping them. So I think that's just really cool. It that, that's, that's, that's everything. The standard. That, that is, <laughs> I think that's the way to be nowadays. I feel like in the future, you know, in order to compete, you're going to have to be okay with, not only okay with, but you have to be a part of the community. Otherwise, at some point in the future, I feel like it's just going to be hard for companies to get traction because at some point this is going to be way more you know, the norm than it is now. Right now, it's like, they're doing what? That's so cool and progressive. That's how it starts, right? But then as it gets going and more companies realize that they can do this and it's a good, it's a good thing to do, then um, everything's better for it. So I, yeah, I'm, I think at this point, like we haven't even gotten to the discussion topic yet. And I'm already sold on it. Yeah. So this is interesting and kind of related. So people have asked me and I, because I've talked about numerous times these different overlay networks and there's a few commercial ones out there that are completely top to bottom proprietary in the it space and i'm not even going to mention them because they're not worth mentioning and one of the problems i had especially when one of the executives i was uh in a private forum so this can't be publicly seen or i'd link to it because <laughs> i wish it could be um i called them out because a bunch of people were promoting them and i said what protocol are you using best in class that's what they reply with i'm like you're i'm i said i'm a network security person i would like to know in more more depth. You know, I understand it from a marketing standpoint, just tell me you're using best in class. Cool. And I asked a more in-depth question and they said, you know, military grade security is how they replied. And this person allegedly was, you know, a technical uh, representative of the place. And I said, and this was turned into a uh, discussion within this forum. I said, no, that's not an acceptable answer. And they, then he said, can I DM you? I'm like, no. I said, you should be able to post publicly what protocols you're using, what your transport layer is, how you're auditing. I said, I see all these people promoting this. I, and one person admitted, oh yeah, by the way, they give me a free copy. That's why I promoted it because I'm on their advisory council. And I'm like, you guys should all disclose this because you're recommending a product and no one's asked the question of this. And why am I the first? 
And I, yeah, you know, I think you handled it way better than me because I would have been more of an a-hole. I would have been like, wow, the BIC protocol. I've never heard of the BIC protocol. Could you please enlighten me more about this BIC protocol? That sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you, because wow. I, and this is uh, the advantage that Tailscale had in the market. Before people want to surrender their uh, control, because this essentially is attaching an extra network adapter directly on your machine. You're loading software to get this working. You're adding an extra network interface on your machine. Well, I should probably know the code that goes in there. There's a lot of trust in there. So by making all of that code and the derp server and the transport layer, which is just WireGuard, um, completely open source, awesome it is clearly transparently done from a trust level and that is part of the beauty of how this works is instantly i like the software it's been vetted it's been it's being used by a lot of large companies obviously so it's hard because anything vetted obviously someone could say well what if someone snuck something in etc cetera, etc cetera. well tales has got a lot of eyes on this they're in control of the project they're reputable therefore not likely someone will slip something in there that's saying is not saying supply chain attacks are impossible but a well uh, documented, well audited process will give you a lot of that confidence in there. And that's what Tailscale's done by putting it in there. Uh, and I also like that they didn't try to roll their own crypto because I have a feeling that other company was not trying to tell me um, that they rolled their own crypto because I would have called them out for that. Um, Tailscale said, nope, nope, we use WireGuard. That is a well vetted, well audited system. We're using WireGuard for transport. End of story. And it makes it. Um, you know, a, a real important aspect of it that they didn't and try to reinvent security because, you know, if anyone listens to security now and Steve Gibson is totally right on this particular topic of quit trying to roll your own security unless that yeah. is what you do for a living. <laughs> yeah, he said that many times in that podcast and we refer to that often because we love that podcast. It's great. Um, security now by GRC uh, slash Steve Gibson. But yeah, he says that a lot because it's true. I mean, why reinvent the wheel? That's why we have shared libraries and things because and, it's a, a thing already. And then they're talking about supply chain attacks. I mean, that could happen to any open source project. If you look at the, I think it was the University of Minnesota debacle. Um, yeah. That was another example of that. It could happen to the best of us, but the fact that it's open source is always going to be an advantage over not being open source, regardless of what could happen. Right. And that's why it's so important. Anytime uh, Steve's mentioned that, it's almost always he he just re-mentions it. And then he leads into the story of how a company got completely taken apart because they rolled their own security and someone found a major flaw in it. So it's <laughs> some of those stories they come up with are just hilarious. Yeah, actually. But anyway, endless because there's always someone doing some silliness there. Now, let's start with Tailscale itself. How do you sign up for it? Um, I bring this up because a few people ask me, like, well, Tailscale, do they have 2FA? Is it a normal VPN? They're just a control plane handler that authorizes the nodes to communicate. No data goes through in any unencrypted form Tailscale. And when they sign up, they have... OAuth 2, OIDC, SAML, uh, which means you can sign up with your Google account, your Microsoft account, your GitHub account. I did that in the demo. Uh, you, They don't actually have username and password management. Um, they don't want it, and I don't blame them. So um, it's always the control plane itself is third-party provider, and then you start authorizing the mm -hmm. nodes. Now, your normal networks work in a way of your hub spoke, you know, everyone VPNs into work, everyone VPNs to the VPN concentrator, the firewall or whatever the device may be on the node. But obviously this is hub spoke and has some limitations to it. Tail scale answers the question of what if we did it like a mesh? So if you have a mesh of, and as I said, the control plane is WireGuard, and the only thing you have to do for any WireGuard node, it just needs the public keys of the other nodes to communicate pretty simple. And WireGuard's lightweight. It's it's low noise. It uses UDP. So you're able to start talking to your friend. So if me and Jay, we want to access a common resource, but sometimes me and Jay would just like to send a file to each other, we can do so. Uh, it allows interconnectivity between all of the different nodes and just by handling the keys. Now, it's only the public key. The private key never leaves tail scale. Hence the reason being open source and uh, wanting to make sure that your machine, as it generates a private key, it doesn't leave. Well, you can look through the code and see. It doesn't need to. That's not how WireGuard works. You only have to share the public key out. That's why WireGuard is such a nice, simple way to do this. Now, creating this mesh network sounds fun, but let's do some math. 
Uh, tunnels sound simple, but a 10 node network would require 10 times nine or 90 wire guard tunnel endpoint configurations to manage. That's just for 10 people uh, or 10 devices that you added to the network. So every node you need uh, to know owns its key plus nine more. Each node would then have to be updated every time you rotate a user in or out. That's actually what's being done. They're just bumping public keys and rotating them in or out as you add things in or out of the network. Uh, this is really simple. When you see them, you can see all the ones within that network. You can see who's on there, but if you want to remove one of the devices from the network, it just updates going, we've removed this device. Please remove that device's public key from every single node. So that is as simple as it works. Um, your private key stays private. This is where everyone thinks, well, if I'm using Tailscale, doesn't that violate the privacy? Now, the only security thing that you have by using Tailscale is nodes can be added and approved by Tailscale, but it is up to you uh, to lock down your nodes to say, these are the nodes I added, these 10 nodes. I'm only going to accept commands, and this is done through ACL rules, from these 10 nodes. End of story. That's where you stop. If someone were to get into your Tailscale account, someone were to maliciously take it over in some way, they could add nodes. But because you didn't allow those nodes, well, they can't talk to you. Now, of note, the default behavior is all nodes are allowed to talk to each other. So it does require some rule creation. They made it simple. They went on, we'll allow nodes to talk to each other. And the control plane just says, all right, everyone can talk to each other unless you create rules not to. So it's kind of up to you if you want to lock it down a little more. A lot of people probably don't do that. And for the home lab use, maybe, you know, you just like, let's leave all the ports open. But it's still up to you to create, even on the individual devices, because it's an extra network adapter, your IP rules still apply. You can still say um, SSH, but only allow from this IP address. And matter of fact, probably a good idea to do that after you set it up and the reason why is because let's say I know my computer's a node and my laptop's a node, and that's where I do my administrative work from. So all the devices I add to it, I say, you can't accept SSH except for from these two devices. And that way, if anyone ever to get in my tail scale network or for some reason, take over some other node, they're like, hey, I managed to take over a node or I took over a device and it happens to have this tail scale access on it. Then they want to pivot somewhere else. Well, you're still following the standard security rules of principles of least privilege and blocking that down. So I don't think it's as much of a worry as people do um, using Tailscale, using their hosted service, which right now you get 20 devices for free. That's probably enough for a lot of lab people to get set up. Their pricing is only a few dollars if you want to use it. But I don't think using their control plane is as big a security risk as the comments immediately on YouTube, the discussion on Reddit about this. is. Everyone's like, I don't trust it because their control plane, they could add a node to my network and where they also make the assumption that the data traverses their nodes. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. None of that happens at all. <laughs> so it, It's hard sometimes to, I mean, privacy is very important, but at the same time, it, it's like, is some is the person worrying for a legitimate reason or are they just worrying because they worry you know it's really yeah. hard to tell the difference and it's not that i'm trying to invalidate anyone here i'm just saying it's just sometimes hard because especially for us when we're doing videos it's like we need to know if there's a legitimate concern here but we also have to figure out which concerns are actually legitimate and sometimes that can be hard to get through um but more to your point i um you know, vet it as best I can. I think that's the best you can do. And then you make the decision for yourself. Yeah. And that's a really, um, it, it's just understanding it. And this is why looking through and having open source code lets you validate all this. And this is extremely well documented on their site. I highly recommend taking a technical code site because if you're not understanding how Sun and App protocols work, they have such a good write-up and it's in the link in the show notes that will help you dive into just how NAT traversal works and all the tricks they've used for it. So that documentation level helps. Now, this is a walk through the steps real quick. Each node generates a random public private key pair for itself and associates a public key with its identity. Pretty simple. This is all done on the node. The private key, as I said, never leaves the node. The node contacts the coordination server that you set by default is going to be Tailscale's public server, but Headscale allows you to set your own. We'll get to that later. Uh, contacts coordination server and leaves it and leaves its public key and a note about where the node can currently be found and the domain it's in. Really simple. It says, hey, here I am. This is the IP address I have. And it figures out the public IP address because the coordination server sees the public IP. But it's also looking at how it got there. So if you're behind CGNAT, because there's no port opening at this point needed um, for any of this, it's saying, hey, this is where I'm at. And it 
traverse through maybe several networks before hitting a public IP, before hitting the coordination server. The node then downloads, because it reached out to the coordination server, and the node then downloads a list of public keys and addresses that it has access to. This is that namespace you set up going, this is Tom's namespace, these are Tom's devices, and I've authorized all these to be on the list. And then they that gathers up all the public keys that were handed out by all the other nodes that contact the coordination server. Uh, the node configures its WireGuard instance with the appropriate set of public keys. Pretty simple uh, to get that working. And essentially, it's almost like a zero trust at that point because you're only trusting things that were put on the coordination server for public keys. Now, this is where the really advanced stuff gets in. This is where it gets kind of fun. Tailscale uses several very advanced techniques based on the internet stun and ice standards to make these connections work, even, even though you wouldn't think it should be possible. This avoids the need for a firewall configuration or any public facing open ports, thus greatly reduces the potential for human error. For UDP, the rule is very simple. The firewall allows inbound UDP packet if previously saw a matching outbound packet. For example, if your laptop sees a UDP packet leaving a laptop from 2.2.2, 1.2.3.4, 2, 7, 7, 7, 7, it'll make a note that incoming packets from 7.7.7, 7, 7, 7, 5, 6, 7, 8, 2, 2, 2, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4 are also fine. The trusted side of the world clearly intend to communicate with the 777, so we should let it talk back. In probability theory, this is what's kind of fun of how they did this. Because UDP, and I want people to stop and think about this just for a moment, put your network engineering hat on, UDP, unlike TCP, uh, it can be spoofed. This is often how some of these like UDP reflection attacks happen because we can spoof where it's coming from and we can lie and we can make changes because, well, it, I would tell you a UDP joke, but you might not get it. It's because it's not verifying it. <laughs> now that playing on that is a lot of fun because it may have a UDP open port open when it talked to a coordination server, but the coordination server is essentially going to talk to another server and trying to get it to land on that UDP port going, all right, you came from 111 and you came from 222 uh, network uh, and you're both talking to me at 333, but now I'm going to lie and say, you should redirect your uh, packets over to the other side. And by doing that, you're kind of it's almost like just bending it so you're spoofing it. But it requires figuring out those ports. And this is where the birthday paradox comes in. And it's a clever way because I, we know there's only in 65,000 some odd ports, but you don't have time to scan them all and you don't want to be scanning everything. So then you say, all right, we can eliminate the first thousand of them because usually things aren't going to be on the low ports when it comes to firewall. But they do um, basically a probability with the birthday paradox in, in probability theory, the birthday paradox asks for the probability that any set of randomly chosen people, at least two will share the same birthday. The birthday paradox is that the counterintuitively, uh, it counter, you counterintuitively think about this. The probability of shared birthdays exceeds 50% in a group of only 23 people. So they're actually able to, um, just by scaling down and guessing at ports, able to guess these ports really fast. They've got this really well documented of exactly how they solve the problem. They even have a little free Python script to do the calculation that they threw in there. If you want to know how fast you can figure out what ports these things are using. Now, what, once you've done this, there's a couple things that are really interesting about the way they can traverse NAT. They're figuring out the UDP ports. Awesome. And that sounds easy enough because you're usually one hop in. But what if? And this is where things get a little bit clever. And I want people to think about this from an interesting perspective of how this works is if you have me and Jay, let's say we were using the same ISP, that ISP is CG natted. And if you're not familiar with carrier grade NAT, it's like having a second layer. So the carrier has a public IP address, but within that network, the ones they would hand out to me and Jay's firewalls are CG NAT or private IP based. So they're not publicly accessible. I can't open ports, but if me and Jay happen to be using the same carrier and Tailscale has some external server outside the carrier and says, both of you guys come from the same IP address. And we can see that it's CG natted because, you know, the hops in between. It can actually form a connection between the two private IP addresses, provided they are able to talk to each other within the same network. I actually demoed this when I was going over some of my overlay network and Tailscale demo. Um, if you have two different subnets, even though they don't have direct paths to each other, they can route through 
PF sense without going to an external network. And by doing that, you're actually not going and exiting out to the public internet. It actually kind of created a connection between two different subnets, even though the rules may say there is no connections. Now you're kind of thinking, isn't this some type of security violation? Isn't this breaking firewall rules? Slightly. The rules have to exist and it depends on the firewall, but let's say I have a subnet that can contact subnet A can contact subnet B, but subnet B cannot talk to subnet A because I've got rules because maybe it's my IoT network. But if you reach out from your network and you don't have something implicitly to block it, subnet A can reach out to subnet like to get to my camera. And because I requested it, it's going to be able to send back data. It's utilizing that principle to essentially get the packets to talk to each other. It's some really cool firewall trickery. So it's just <clears throat> um, really slick how they're able to make all that work. Now, there are certain times, and I like the way they actually worded this, some especially cruel networks block UDP entirely. So this is where... And this is a rare exception, but there are weird times when you run into firewalls to do this. They go, you know what we're going to do? We're going to eliminate UDP on this network. That's a terrible idea. One, the QIC protocol has become very popular. It's basically 443. It's the way a lot of websites are traversing things faster because UDP doesn't have the extra overhead that TCP does. It's fewer packets. So you ruin people's web experience by doing things like blocking UDP. But Let's say you're on a network that is super locked down with UDP being blocked. This is where it switches over to that DERP protocol we mentioned earlier, which is DERP designated encrypted relay for packets. Once again, it's still using WireGuard as a transport layer, but this is where your DERP servers come in and Tailscale has a lot of them. Headscale has one as well. And it's basically going, okay, we're going TCP over 443 because, well, if you're on the internet, that's probably not blocked and we're going to just traverse that. So you're encapsulating it. Now that is where you're going to see a significant slowdown by doing it, but it's really cool that that is like the absolute fallback. So uh, they've covered pretty much all the bases of all the different ways you can get tail scale connected without opening ports. That's the part that really impressed me. And it's all well documented step-by-step step in a massive NAT write up they have. <laughs> wow. That's actually amazing. Like I'm, I'm literally installing it and learning it at the same time. <laughs> Just seeing, mm -hmm. I mean, cause it's going to take me a while to dive in, but um, yeah, so far this sounds like an amazing technology. Yeah, it's just kind of, it's a lot to wrap your head around to think about all the different things that they can do like that um, to be able to, you know, figure all the ports, align them and make it all work. And on that, you know, worst case scenario, someone has decided to do this. It goes, well, I'm, I'm going to go to the derp server and we're going to wrap it in TCP because it's the only way this firewall will let this stuff out of here um, is 443 TCP. That's what it defaults to. And they have a breakdown of that. Now, when you're setting up and we'll get just a head scale, <clears throat> if you don't, you don't necessarily have to set up the derp server. It's enabled, it's disabled by default when you self-host. It's enabled by default when Tailscale uses it because there's some extra steps you need to do to get the derp server running. Um, but for the most part, I've not needed it because I haven't been behind any networks that go as far as you know implicit port blocking. I don't see them as much anymore. I see them occasionally. I mean, there's there's high security environments. And what some companies may do, and I've I had a couple of people that kind of overthink this, but they go, shouldn't firewalls block all outgoing traffic. And I'm like, not really, because you're going to get a headache because when you do that, you'll find so many services that break. And this is a common question just in general firewall setup. Shouldn't it be block all outgoing unless I implicitly allow it? I'm like, good luck, buddy. You've now created a job for yourself. <laughs> and because yeah, you'll realize the error of your ways the first time you run an apt update command. Yep. Do you'll run in so many problems by doing that? Doesn't mean someone hasn't done it. Doesn't mean someone's not going to go. I want to implicitly only allow connections to leave this network that I have designated. That's fine. But you just got to remember if you want things to work, you'll start finding it just breaks everything. So it's why it's not as commonly done. It was actually more popular years ago because there were so few things on the internet that needed to get online. People just needed to get to websites. So you would only allow that. So, you know, bring us all the way to 2022 where the average general home user has a dozen devices that all reaching out and beaconing. You're like, oh yeah, I can't just block outgoing because I'll spend a lot of time uh, creating firewall rules to it. So usually allow outbound. So generally you're not needing it, but it's cool that they have it. It is a fallback. Now that's obviously where things get high latency and slowed down because once you take a fast UDP wire guard protocol and we're going to wrap 
a UDP and a TCP and relay it and bounce it off of an external server to get back to where it needs to be. Yeah, now you've got it. Your latency is going to go up. It's not the most ideal situation, but good that you can still connect. So I can still SSH into things. I can still get some data across. So all that's still functioning and working. So I, yeah, glad it has that fallback on there. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what about hosting it yourself? Now, a couple of things about Tailscale. It's all done. And so is the head scale tool. It's all written in Go. And for the most part, uh, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but this still applies to both Headscale and Tailscale. Uh, it's really only made to support TCP and UDP connections, and they have a reassembler, essentially. Uh, this is in their documentation as well, for doing uh, ICMP packets. So you can ping, you can use TCP and UDP, what it's not designed for. And this is important. It's not designed to uh, route every other protocol that you may want to use. You're like, well, what about MDNS and using my Chromecast over it? I'm like, you need to use uh, certain streams for this. So this is not exactly um, uh, ideal for that right there. So that's, yeah, you're also going to lose some speed because it's all written with the WireGuard Go implementation that makes it portable and works with everything. And I know, you know, there is a kernel implementation of WireGuard for both BSD and for Linux, but um, the way the encapsulation works is for that. So all this is written in Go. So there are certain overheads where Go just isn't going to be performant because the context switching because Go operates in user space with this. So um, those are all notes on there. Now let's get over to hosting it yourself. And this is kind of clever because they have head scale. Uh, Tailscale is a modern VPN, is how it starts out, and it works for like an overlay network, as we said. Everything in tail, Tailscale is open source except the GUI, uh, clients for proprietary OSs, Windows, uh, Mac, and iOS, and the control server. And that's what Headscale is, is replacing that control server. The control server works in exchange point for WireGuard public keys, as we said, and Headscale aims to implement a self-hosted open source alternative to the Tailscale control server. Headscale has a narrower scope and instance of Headscale implements a single tailnet, which typically what a single organization or home personal setup will use. So they're only building a single Tailscale network, which is fine. You can add separate namespaces within there. So there's a lot of support uh, for doing, you can still connect multiple servers. Most time people, you spin up a Headscale server so you can do a single thing. So here's the full features it has. Full base support for Tailscale's features, configurable DNS, including split DNS, node registration, and single sign-on via OpenID Connect pre-authorization keys. Now, the pre-authorization key is important because that's how some devices want to register. There's different ways you register Tailscale devices. You're going to run the tail scale up command and say, I just want to register this device. And it creates a link. You click the link and you're signed into your tail scale account and away you go. By creating the pre-authorization key, which is another one, you're basically saying tail scale, use this key. And then you point it at the server that generated the key. By default, if you put no server, it goes to the tail scales servers, but you can specify wherever your head scale is. Now, head scale has to be run somewhere. Hey, and preferably like on our sponsors, Linode, you have to run it on a public IP address. You could do testing internally, absolutely, but obviously that tail scaling around your own network, you could already talk to everything on your own network. So it doesn't seem like the most ideal situation. Uh, you want it on a public IP. That way, if me and Jay wanted to talk, we're both stuck behind CGNet. We can't open up firewall ports. We can't figure out how to communicate, but we like to share something. We like to uh, share a server. We could set up a tail scale node. We'd set up a head scale node, I should say. In Linode, we need the most minimum because the traffic's not really traversing there. Unless you get all the way into the derp server, not likely. Uh, it's just coordinating the key coordination. It just sends kilobytes. It needs like nothing. You can do the lowest level. What's the lowest tier that uh, Linode has? Is it like $5 a month right now? Yeah, it's the shared CPU, one gig, um, one CPU, I believe. Um, I'll verify. Yeah. yeah, but it's like the most basic. So it's not it's not intensive. Even if you have a large scale network, it's just sharing some. If you look uh, WireGuard, you see how small the keys are. You're like, that's it. That's all it does. I'm like, yeah, it just uh, coordinates the keys. No, nothing complicated there. Uh, 
Now there is, and I have not used this. This is a uh, feature that they've added since I did my original video on Tailscale. There's like tail drop file sharing. Uh, it actually has that in there. So they've got uh, some tools for just sharing files with Tailscale as a protocol. So it just goes through Tailscale network. So that's kind of cool. Um, it also supports multiple IP ranges in a Tailnet. Uh, supports IPv6, which will make somebody really happy. Um, I've only set up an IB before. Uh, it does support route advertising ephemeral nodes and of course a derp server now the route advertising uh, as i mentioned is a feature that's really cool that entail scale for setting it up on pf sense or really if you wanted to build and hand write your own linux router could do that too and then you say this is a route and i'm advertising these routes to all of my machines on this particular tail scale namespace and then you can say, all right, I would need my phone to get to this router. My PF sense is the example I use from there. And now I can get to all the devices on there. So this is supported not just in tail scale, but in head scale as well. And it also supports that ephemeral node thing. I think the ephemeral node is kind of a clever uh, function they added. If I only temporarily needed one of you to access something, I could create an implicit rule and say, here's your ephemeral key and ephemeral node. Go ahead and attach. One, I can delete it or set an expiration date on it. But two, um, the moment you disconnect, you can't reconnect again. So if I had a temporary server I needed to transfer files to or a temporary thing I needed to share with people, I could lock it down with some ACL rules. I know when you're assigning these, what IP address you're going to get. I can say, here's your node. Connect, get your thing done. And this is good for maybe even a temporary contractor who only needs to be in for a certain amount of time. You can allow them to your tail scale network to help administer something. So I can say, hey, Jay, I need help with uh, setting up this wiki. Jay can get an ephemeral key. He logs in, he does his thing. Hey, Tom, is it working? Yes, great. As soon as he disconnects, that way if I forget, the ephemeral node means it goes away. He can't reconnect. He can type it again. It doesn't do anything. Uh, I have to generate a new one. So this is kind of nice when you're using these pre-auth keys. Now, the one thing about HellScale, uh, HeadScale, HeadScale does not have a UI at the moment. And this is, you know, recorded in July of 2022. So this is all command line managed. Now, it's all simple end curses. You know, type the command, you spin up the server. They don't even have an installer for it, essentially. You just download the binary. They have an instruction how to do their config file. It's all pretty basic. I haven't done a video tutorial on it yet, but I probably will to get people's steps on there. Um, it will work with um, just an IP address, but I probably recommend having a DNS entry for it. That way, if you ever move the server or the database around, which it's really simple, it just sets up a SQL Lite database, but it actually can use, if you did this at a large scale install, you can use other databases, I believe it's under a roadmap. And I think something, I, I seen one of the write-ups for someone said they were using Postgres with it, but even with a SQL Lite database, you're not really tracking much. You're just tracking who's got what public key and how many nodes you have on there. And I imagine it's quite scalable, even with just a SQL Lite database. You just control even the command line though uh, for setting these up viewing them but for the most part once you've added the nodes unless you're adding and removing nodes a lot you're really not doing much with it it just sits there idles and telling the servers that beacon out to say here i am and if their ip address changes like phones do or you're you know moving out to your laptop it just coordinates making sure that the connectivity is facilitated like hey tom's laptop is on this ip address now he traveled now it's on this ip address so it's always just creating that route back for you so it's not much on there. And of course, if anyone were to compromise, back to what we said, if someone compromised Tailscale, someone compromised the server you set up because, whoops, you forgot and left SSH open to the world and you didn't have a strong password, you didn't have key authentication, what could they do? Well, turn it off. That would be annoying. Second, they could add more nodes, but you would also notice the nodes being added. And back to my original, hey, practice principles of least security, you know what IP addresses are being assigned. They can't assign another IP address that's already assigned on there. They can't re-register these nodes to impersonate you easily there because you'd have a conflict. So yeah, as long as you're practicing all the principles, if someone compromised it, the worst case scenario is that they'd be able to add more nodes. And hopefully you've protected against that because, well, you've locked it down to all the nodes you want to have. Pretty simple. Well, simple in theory, complicated if you actually take the time to read all of it on there. So. <laughs> well, anytime you have network things and you know being developed i mean the amount of work the the people spent making this happen is immense so um yeah there's definitely a lot of layers yeah 
Uh, someone said, could it be run on a DDNS address? Uh, yeah, you could you could run it wherever you want. The, you know, it just needs a um, a common place. If you're using DNS, which it was I think would be preferred rather than IP, um, wherever you run the head scale server, as long as it has a common place because you've specified, um, I think mine is headscaledemo.lawrencesystems.com. I think that's what the I, I got. I'll actually be revealing that to so people can poke at it. So I'll leave the server up and running so people can you know do the thing because it's all just demo stuff I'm setting up for the video. But um, I leave it at that. Now, if I ever change IP addresses, I'll just update my DNS entry I have for it. So, yeah, it shouldn't matter because all the nodes I'm connecting, they're all looking for that same DNS entry. Uh, this allows me to shuffle it around. So that's why I recommend DNS. So I don't see any problem with using DDNS. Uh, someone says, will it work with CGNAT like Starlink? Absolutely. It'll work with CGNAT. And of course, Starlink uh, is becoming more popular. And yeah, that solves that problem too for Starlink. Cool. Yeah, it's it's a lot. Um, like I said, I'll probably work on the, the tutorials. The write-ups are solid. Um, I misread a few things. Definitely use their config file and read their config file properly and do the things they say in their config file. Because I thought I was aggravated with it when I was talking to Jay. I think on Monday, I expressed some aggravation for lack of documentation. It turns out I was RTFMing wrong. <laughs> so oh boy. I overlooked something. Um, and when I was, I, I once I stared at it and realized my uh, mistake, um, yeah, there was a problem. Now I haven't tested this yet. And this is the part that I need to do for the tutorial. I want to make sure I get the derp server set up without the derp server. It's really easy with the derp server. I need to make sure I'm understanding how they're using let's encrypt because they have the, uh, all the Acme stuff built in for setting up let's encrypt because derp servers do seem to need let's encrypt to work because they're working over 443 with a cert in, in the case of a derp server, you have to be using DNS to make that work. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. You need to you need to have that um, so it can do the challenge response and um, get a certificate installed. And I've seen a few people mention, and this is the part of the documentation, at least for me, it wasn't 100%. Uh, well, it looks like they, for the Derp server, they set up a reverse proxy uh, with Nginx. And um, it's not necessary to do, but it's something you can do. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly why. They, I think it's because Nginx works better, but I can't tell if that's part of someone else's old write-up in Reddit or if that's something you need to do now because it appears to be built into the head scale itself. But the, for like most part, not everyone's going to need the Derp server. I got it running without it, even with my restrictive firewall rules and things like that, playing around with it. I never had a problem getting all the devices connected or PFSense. Hmm. Yeah, I'm running through the install instructions right now. They're super easy. Like I'm just copying, pasting commands and doing exactly what they um, say to do. And it's, I mean, yeah, things are happening right. the way they say they will. So it's great when you read them and then you read them properly and then they work. <laughs> you know, let's not get crazy now. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a little bit overboard. Doing it right the first time. Come on. Who, who are we? I know. Why, why spend 10 minutes reading documentation when you can spend two hours mashing the keyboard? <laughs> <laughs> and sharing and you know all that other stuff just going why doesn't out. it work why derp, doesn't it the derp start? Too. <laughs> <laughs> you're the derp this time <laughs> yeah yeah um i did see and i i don't have an answer for this uh is head scale good enough for production i haven't run head scale over time long enough to say that i would trust it for production um the project's been around for a little while but I don't know. I just don't know the answer. Does it seem very actively developed? Yes. Does it, uh, when did it start? I don't know. This is not an old project. Um, this project's not been around for a long time, but then again, neither is tail scale. So I don't, I don't remember when the exact start date was for this project. Um, hmm. but they do seem to be doing a lot of releases, which seem to be mostly feature enhancements. So, that's that's at least a good thing. Um, let me see. What was the first release? How long ago has this project been around? I guess that's probably a fair question. 2021. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I whether or not you want to now the project's based on this. And as I said, version one started in June of 2021. So it's not a particularly older, mature project. So I don't know. Um, but if you're a good network engineer, I don't see why not spinning it up and trying to see what happens on there. Worst case is you switch back to actually using tail scale for the control plane. So you actually have a fallback plan if it doesn't work. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. 
So hopefully that makes sense. I don't know. A project that's been around for a year that's open source that has no business model behind it. That's just a bunch of code contributors. I don't know that I'd run it in production is probably the where I land on it. So if one of my clients said, hey, Tom, should we run this in production? I'd say use TailScale. They, they're solid. They're, they've been around for a few years. They're a big company with a good staff. Uh, they care about privacy, security, and everything else. So I would absolutely say use that product. I trust it. It is trusted by many large companies. Uh, for home lab users, worst case is you lose some connectivity that you somehow had connectivity to establish a connectivity. So you have a fallback plan and you're just inconvenienced if it goes down. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I agree. I think it, I mean, for production use, I mean, enterprise stuff, you want it to be around for a while and prove itself yeah. for a bit longer than, than it has so far. Yeah, I mean, they have a lot of people contributing to it, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, and they have a sponsor button and I may sponsor it. So there's, it comes down to I, currently, if those people that are contributing get bored or, you know, I, I get bored is probably not the right term. This happens a lot in open source projects where they start out really well. We get excited about it, but if they have no way to do it, or it's a hobby project for someone, cause they have a day job, their day job may become more demanding, or in some case they may have children or something that become more demanding and they go, mm -hmm. I don't got time for this project. And then the project just stops. And then that can be a big problem. And that's how I feel about this. It's in its early beginnings, uh, unless the person commits full time to it. I haven't really dug into the person. It seems like a side project for them. Uh, but hey, nonetheless, it's open source. It can be forked and someone else can pick it up and run with it. So that part's a little fuzzy. I would say I'm certifying it for home lab use. <laughs> there you go. I and think it's, that's fair enough. It's a great learning opportunity, um, especially just understanding network engineering better. You will come out of this. Um, understanding things better more than anything else. You can play around with firewalls more. You can start I, any time you want to understand security or how things traverse the firewall, um, having a task, having a goal of, I want to get this set up. I want to spin up a server. I want to make this happen. I want to set up an exit node to tunnel my traffic through where you have to do a few extra steps. Those are all things that will help get your network engineering. So if you decide to just do this as a hobby or do this professionally, you have a better understanding of how things actually work by going through those steps. Take notes along the way of that you did, because even that how I, even though I didn't read the documentation properly, I did make notes. That's how I knew how I screwed up. This is where Tom knew where you went wrong. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. But that's what we have for Tailscale. Thank you all for joining us. That was a lot yeah. of fun. So I learned a lot myself. This is going to be, um, I'm just going to keep plugging away because I've been listening and actually like many of our audience members, just following along and having fun. So the instructions are pretty easy and straightforward. So um, if you're interested, I think it's probably a fun project. Yeah. This is where, um, you know, not everyone realizes and where Jay is really good at automation. I have a little bit more experience with some of the networking stuff, but that's why mm -hmm. me and him will share so much things. He helps me out with a lot of Linux automation stuff or commands. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes thinking about how some of the networking stuff works, there can be some of those details. It's it's a lot. There's a, a lot to know. That's why we bounce ideas off each other. That's why Jay was a little bit more quiet on this one. This was more of a uh, consuming of NAT knowledge. <laughs> I think we pretty much take turns being the quiet one because yeah. it could be something like I know very well or something that you know very well. I feel like the, the as long as we've known each other, it's always like we kind of complement each other's, I don't want to say weaknesses because they're not. It's just like your focus and my focus are completely different. But when you put them together, they equal like one main thing. So it's like content just flows pretty easily at that point. So. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Someone asking this question, TCP, UDP, ICMP. That's where the protocol levels stop in here. So. And now we have BIC. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the BIC protocol. I think I'm going to call call it that when I, whenever I deal with marketing and, and they sound like they or they're trying to sound like they know technology. I'm just going to from now on just say, oh, that's the BIC protocol. Got it. And that'll just be our inside term for its BS. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we could say the uh, bs protocol that's too obvious when you're talking to people so yes absolutely all right well thanks everyone for joining us uh links are already in the description of this video and of course if you're listening to this a podcast you're going to be in the show notes there but it's basically all the stuff um it's all the stuff that is on the tail scale site you can check it out i also left the link to head scale easy enough to find um so plenty of reading to do get started uh, hopefully all of you have fun with this project all right, thanks. Yep. Thank you.